Hi everyone. I wanted to make this video to discuss uh, a little bit about the final project. Hopefully you have started it at this point, uh, or have at least looked over the, the project handout and have a good understanding of the questions that are being asked and the analysis you have to do. Uh, today I wanted to just record a little bit about what the, the physical situation is. Um, all right, so this will be going into the, the first section of your report. I'm um, just describing the, the general setup and uh, go through just a little bit of the mathematical analysis that you'll need to do. Um, I won't walk through it step by step like we've done for the last projects, but I'll try to uh, give you an idea of uh, sort of what mathematical steps or operations need to be taken. So for this project, this is the final project. The, the basic idea here is that, maybe I'll just say it in words first, we essentially have um, a study involving these insects which enter a state of uh, diapause, which I believe is a technical term. Um, in my mind, at least I'm imagining this is uh, some type of hibernation uh, <clears throat> for insects. Um, and insects enter this state when a certain chemical or hormone um, they have uh, is reduced in levels. And so, just to recap that, we have insects entering diapause, essentially when a certain chemical or hormone Uh, drops to a certain level. And you can look through the project handout. There's a very detailed description of the actual physical situation there that goes into more uh, detail about what exactly this chemical is and what insect species um, we're considering in this uh, particular project. And I would recommend uh, reading up a little bit on that just so you can provide some extra um, explanation and motivation in that first part of your, your project. Um, and so what we're going to do is, well, we have a, um, a, a secondary chemical, I guess, um, which is released, and it's kind of this oscillatory chemical. And this secondary chemical actually inhibits this first chemical, the one that I've talked about here in this first point. And so if it, inhibit it, if it inhibits it, then it reduces the amount of it, right? And so this oscillatory chemical will slowly over time oscillate and reduce the level of this first chemical until some point, um, at some point the chemical, the first chemical drops below a certain level and the insects enters this diapause state. Um, so what we're going, what we're going to do is uh, use a model for a separate chemical. Maybe just to make it clear that it's something different, I'll denote it C. That'll be our running name for it. And the thing about this chemical is that it inhibits let's say this chemical here is called uh, A or something. So this secondary chemical C inhibits the first chemical A. And we also have another phenomenon where this chemical C, it oscillates over time. Okay, and with those two in mind, our goal for this project is the following. Essentially to model with some mathematical equation uh, the level of this chemical C as a function of time. Okay. And what happens here is that we have um, 
one equation that is coming from a model already. Um, it has a bunch of unknown parameters. So I'll just write out what the equation actually is here. It's something of this form. C of t is equal to a naught. You take e to some power. There will be a lot of things in that exponent. I'm going to write them as fractions in the project handout. Um, there'll be decimals, but you should be able to convert back and forth pretty easily. Uh, let's see. So we'll have a minus b. There will be t sub d squared, and I'll try to say what these variables uh, mean afterward. There's a d s sub r squared, and all of this is being multiplied by t. And I maybe need to make a little bit more room here. This is a long equation. And then we have something like cosine of a bunch of stuff, and that stuff is, well, there's one term that looks like following for t sub d over 5 plus s r over 5 and there's uh, t appearing there there's some phi a phase shift and then at the end there's also some kind of shift a naught um, so it's maybe helpful to try and group some of these up to figure out what's unknown at what point so a naught, uh, for at least the first two or three parts of the project, um, you will not have a value for this, uh, nor will you need it. For the first part, we'll be focusing on solving to extract these green variables here, b and d. And for a second part, we'll work on extracting these blue ones. It's t sub d and s sub r. And maybe this phase shift phi will also come in uh, closer to the end. Okay, and I should say what some of these variables are at least. Um, so maybe an intermediate goal here. Maybe intermediate goals. So maybe the first part will be to um, use experimental data to solve for well essentially the two green variables here so this experimental data will come from the actual project handout um, it's sort of listed out in some section, and I'll go into that in just a little bit more detail when we do the mathematical der derivation here. And after that, we would somehow like to solve for, well, maybe that's not the best way to put it. Um, Yeah, maybe the best way to say it is to uh, solve for one of TD or SR. These are these blue ones from above. So you solve for one of them in terms of the other. And the whole point of this is that somehow at the end of the day you want to get some c of t and it'll be equal to essentially this formula up here but the only kind of unknown you'll be seeing is maybe s sub r for example if that's what you solve for so that's uh the only unknown that'll be appearing here aside from the ones in red so you essentially want to knock out say like the b the d and the t sub d and get everything in terms of s sub r and later on that'll um, be useful because there's an optimization step um, i'll say a little bit about that uh, shortly and just a really quick uh, note about what these variables actually are this td is supposed to denote some kind of time delay so the idea is that somehow this equation um, 
So this is giving you sort of a level of this chemical C as a function of time. And this T sub D is a parameter that says, well, the level now kind of depends on what it was 10 seconds ago or 20 seconds ago or something like that. There's some delay parameter where it depends on some previous value in some way. And this S sub R, this is a synthesis rate. And you can read more in the project handout about what exactly this signifies when you look at the physical situation. Um, but you can think of it as essentially um, controlling uh, sort of how fast this exponential decay is happening. Where we see that this, this term here, it's like e to some kind of power, and that power ends up being something that's negative. So it'll be a form of exponential decay. OK, so we just section these off. I'll try to post these notes up along with the video. Um, one thing to notice before I leave this page is that um, there's sort of two main things happening here. There's this one giant term on the left, um, and then there's something that looks like a wave here. So the first term is, you can think of it as, as a kind of amplitude of this uh, wave, except for the amplitude depends on time, right? So it's not just a sine wave with one fixed amplitude, it's a sine wave where the amplitude is like changing at every moment in time. Uh, I'll try to draw a picture that shows that a little bit more clearly. Um, but one thing to note here is that whatever this quantity is appearing there in front of the T, if you just kind of put on your math blinders and just think about like what's the, what's the parent function for this, if I try to abstract away everything that's a number or a variable here, um, you just think of this as some kind of um, omega, so some frequency for this sine wave. And that'll be useful later because we'll have some data about the period, and we can relate the period to the frequency, and we can maybe um, use this to help solve for TD in terms of SR or vice versa, because we have some equation uh, relating them. Okay, so just a really quick sketch about sketch of uh, what's going on here, just so you have an idea. So I'm going to try to plot uh, essentially C of T versus T here. So that'll be my T axis. This will be my C of T. And at time zero, this chemical will have some value. I don't quite know what it is. Um, Let's see, I'll need to sort of draw a sort of tube that this function will live in for all time. So it'll be something like this. And what's happening, um, well, we aren't really considering times before zero, uh, but you can imagine that if you were, there would just be some kind of sine wave, which is just uh, usual kind of thing that we're used to seeing from class. So it has some period, uh, some amplitude, a frequency, um, all of the good stuff. And there is one spot worth noting here is that you know, it has some, I haven't drawn it super accurately here, um, but it has some amplitude measured by the displacement, not from zero, remember that the the amplitude is not really measuring like the height of this function over time or anything. It's measuring how far away it oscillates from sort of a midpoint here. Um, so it has some amplitude, but this amplitude is constant um, before time zero, if you want to think of it that way. What happens after time zero is a little bit more complicated. Essentially, we have some uh, exponential function. I'll just kind of draw just what that piece looks like. Uh, different color here. I'm gonna do that in green. So there's some kind of like exponential function, which is not asymptotic to zero, but is rather asymptotic to, so remember that this, this function C of T was sort of shifted up a little bit. So as you kind of go out to infinity, um, 
Oh, let me go back to this, this equation here. If you think about kind of what's happening with this term, with this entire equation, this thing is going to be exponential decay on the left. So as, as you take bigger and bigger numbers, this thing will get smaller and smaller and smaller, which means that if you take numbers big enough, this entire term here, so the entire cosine wave will be kind of like damped out. It'll be going to zero. It'll have no oscillation. Um, so this entire term I've squared in green here will be sort of getting smaller and smaller and going to zero. But notice that this shift here isn't really changing over time. Um, so this thing isn't actually limiting to zero. It's limiting to something like probably a naught down here. And what you have going on in the meantime is you have some kind of sine wave continues on but its amplitude is being controlled by this um, exponential envelope here and actually I can go ahead and fill this uh, fill this part of the graph in since this is where the graph will actually exist and you know as you go out to infinity it kind of damps off and the oscillations get smaller and smaller. So it's important to note that this is going to be some kind of shifted cosine or a shifted sine, so it's not necessarily starting at its zero point here. So this is just t equals zero, but it's not necessarily, um, you know, you don't want to think of this as like y equals zero or something like that, or y equals one. It's not starting out at the minimum or the maximum necessarily, or the, the midpoint of its... Um, like where a usual sine wave would go. And so we, I guess what happens here is that um, one thing you can pull off of this graph is that at some point there's this ideal situation where I think this t equals two days. And if you kind of go out to this time here and kind of see where that happens, the idea is that after you are in this region to the right of t equals two days, something is happening here. So this is essentially where the amplitude uh, reaches. I want to say it's 40% is what they say is ideal. All right, so this amplitude is kind of dying off over time. It's sort of at 100% at time zero, and at some point, you know, it's 80%, at some point it's 70%. And certainly at some point it's 40%. And coming from the sort of scientific data, you're saying ideally that should be at t equals two days. And then what happens is that once the chemical drops below this level, this is when the insect inser in enters, in when the insect enters this uh, diapause state. And that's, you know, for the rest of time. Okay, and I think that's all I want to say about this graph here. So I'll, I'll maybe list out what, what data do we have. And I would say for this first part, they're really... Uh, four important things to note from the project handout. One is that at TD equal to 27.0, uh, I'll leave it up to you to figure out what the, the units are here, but you might have to adjust things. Um, if you're doing everything in terms of days, for example, then you might want to check the units here and make sure that things match up. So if you have TD equals 27.0 and SR equals 0 0.13 then something happens the oscillations decrease to I think this one is 80 percent after or really at t equals 0 0.5 days, one half of the day. And so, warning here, you may need to convert to hours or minutes or seconds or something like that.
um, just to make sure that all of your time units are consistent. Okay, and we have a second piece of data, which is essentially, it's really the, the first one, but with some different numbers, which is why I'm just copying it down here. The second one is now if TD is 38.5, and SR is instead 0 0.10, then it reaches 70% at t equals one half days. Same word of warning there, you might have to convert. <clears throat> there will be, uh, there's an estimated number of periods per day explained in the handout. And that looks to be 70, to be 72. And this fourth, fourth piece of information we've already uh, stated in the graph, but we'll need it um, in the calculation, is that the diapause uh, state is triggered when the oscillations decrease to 40%. And then the ideally This is at t equals uh, two days. Okay, so what are some things you're going to do here? I'll just say in words. <clears throat> the first thing, the first sort of major goal is we want to uh, get an equation for uh, c of t just in terms of either t sub d or s sub r. We can solve for one in terms of the other. Um, what will you do after that? You'll do some sort of sensitivity analysis, it, essentially just like um, maybe project one and project two, changing some of the parameters, seeing how much the outputs change, um, maybe describing which ones, uh, which which of these parameters uh, more heavily influences the amount of this chemical, what's the most important one, the one you need to measure most carefully. Um, and at some point you'll need to determine a hypothetical value for both TD and S of R uh, that give you the slowest rate of decay. And so this is going to be um, a maximization problem. And essentially what you'll get here is something like a quadratic, so it'll be something familiar to you, right? We're just finding a parabola. We have a parabola and we're just finding the, the max or the midpoint on it, so the vertex of this parabola. Okay, so now that we have sort of a, a larger idea of what the strategy is, let's see what this first step we need to do uh, will be so yeah on the way to so we need c of t equals some function maybe involving just sr so that's kind of like our main goal and then a sub goal here is we need to solve for uh, what do we call these variables? Uh, B and D. Okay, so let's look at that. Solving for B and D. So essentially we're going to use, um, let me go back, pull a copy of the actual equation here. So this is the giant long equation. very complex, but we won't need all of that complexity all the time. Let me just erase some stuff to clean this up. Okay, so here is Oh no, I've lost part of the Let's see if I can grab it. Okay, cool. Okay, so here is the original form of the equation. And what I would like to do is put on some math blinders. So I want to see this as C of T equals, well, don't really care so much about what's in this term right here for this uh, exact moment. 
So I'm just going to call this some f of t. And what do I see in the next term? I see a cosine of, well, something complicated, but it's just some g of t. And then there's kind of this plus a naught on the end. Okay, so just giving different names to things. Um, why is this a useful thing to do? Because we want to, going back to this, we want to make use of these first two pieces of information to solve for B and D. And these are telling something, uh, telling us something about, okay, the oscillations are decreasing to some percentage of their original value. And so writing it this way, sort of what is, what is the amplitude in this original function here? Well, it's everything kind of out in front of the cosine, so it's really this entire term. So this is like an amplitude. What does that translate to down here? Well, this whole thing is an amplitude. And so if I use that information from one, so let's use number one from the last page. Just a quick reminder of what that was. This said that when TD was 27, SR 0 0.13, then we had an 80% so we had oscillations that were 80% of what they could have been at the maximum occurring at t equals one half. Okay, how do I write this in mathematics? So this is telling me that essentially a naught times f of t is equal to 0 0.8 f of, I'm oh, sorry, a naught. Right, so 80% of the original oscillation or the original amplitude. So remember that this whole term here, just to say not f of t, this is just another way of saying the, the amplitude at time t. The right hand side is saying it's equal to 80% of the original amplitude in words. And this happens at t equals one half. Another way of saying that is that a naught of f of one half equals 0 0.8 a naught. And I've just written this, but let's go ahead and assume a naught is not zero. <clears throat> so we can divide through. And we have an equation like this, f of 1 half is equal to 0 0.8. Uh, but I've left out a little bit of information here. We've kind of forgotten the fact that this actually relied on some very specific uh, parameters. Let's see, so this was when td equals 27.0 and sr equals 0 0.13. So this f of t that I've written here isn't really the same as this f of t. Just kind of tracing that back was this exponential term here. Because this f of t has td and sr as unknowns. And so what I'm going to do is actually just plug in the td and sr values I get. Um, and so I should really be calling this something like, this is like an f1 of t and f1 of t. And so what is f1 of t? Something that looks like e to the, let's see, we had five one hundredths plus, well, I guess this is a negative or minus a b, but we plug in td squared, so there's a 27.0 squared minus a d, 0 0.13 squared. And I'm just leaving t to be a variable here. So maybe I'll just make this a note off to the side that f1 of t is just literally equal to what I've written here. Why am I calling it f1 of t? Because like f of t is with all of these unknowns, td and sr. f1 of t is where I'm plugging in this uh, first set of, like this first experiment um, where we determine these two variables, td and sr. Um, so this is like some modification of f, and we'll see a little bit later. We'll want to keep these names um, separate a little bit. Uh, let's see, what do you get here? So you get something that looks like that's maybe easier on a new page. 
So you have something that's like f1 at, maybe this is one half. Keep in mind that this is in days, so you may need to convert this to 12 hours. Um, it's equal to 0 0.8. This is just, this just follows from the previous stuff. So now let's kind of unbox what, what we had uh, called f1. So this is saying e to the 5 over 100 minus b td squared. And we had a value for td. So this was uh, so 27.0 squared minus d and then sr squared. So this was 0 0.13 squared. And we're evaluating at a specific t, so maybe this is one half, equals 0 0.8. Okay, so that's just rewriting the equation. I've kind of packed everything up nicely in order to make the intermediate equations a little bit easier to handle, but now we have to unpack it and actually solve it. So what am I going to do now? Well, standard maneuver from this course. I'm going to apply the natural log to both sides. And we remember that we can do this because the exponential and a natural log are inverse pairs. Now you might be a little bit concerned about domains and ranges, so I'll leave it up to you to check to make sure that this move here should be justified. So applying log to both sides and kind of log, uh, the log of e to the thing just being that thing uh, you should say some words about why that why that works. Uh, okay, so you have some equation here, and the important thing to note is that there is a b, there is a d, and everything else is a number. Uh, so this is good. So we have one equation, one equation, and two unknowns and we've seen this kind of thing before where if we have two unknowns we kind of need two equations in order to pin everything down uh, so we need to do something else now so we have one equation let's, let's bookmark this this will be important for us maybe like one of our major equations yeah I would maybe label it in your report, say this is equation number one or something like that. Um, give it some kind of name so you can refer back to it later saying, okay, now using equation one and equation two, we're doing such and such. Um, but it helps to kind of keep track of things that way. So what I claim to do here, what I claim the, uh, the best, best thing to do next is to now use number two Sorry, let's go all the way back. So we've kind of reached the end of what we can do with this first piece of data. And so we've used now this one. So next up is using this second piece of data. And you can see it's really just going to be the same game, but I'll try to write out a few steps. So what happens for number two? Well, I'm really just going to write out something of the form. Well, let's see how much how much can we copy from from the previous one. Uh, let's do this, and just see what we need to change. Okay, so C of T is essentially. I mean, we haven't changed what the formula is for that, so that can stay. In your report, you don't have to re-mention what this formula is here. I'm just putting it here um, so we can look at it along with these more complicated formulas. Uh, this this was like a simplification step, right? I just kind of wrote the formula in a different way where I put on uh, sort of math blinders to abstract away some things. Um, now we want to use number two. And what did number two say? So I'm going to move this off to the side. This said that a naught, so we're going to have to have a different name for a function here. Maybe I'll call this f2. 
And this was telling us something about, uh, I want to say it was 70%. Just double check. Yeah, so the important variables here were 38.5, 0 0.1, and 70%. And just so those are, you have those for a reference. Okay, so that means that, so just write this in, just reading this part here in words. This is saying that, so what is F2? F2 is where I plugged in some new values of TD and S sub R, and I'm saying that, well, the amplitude, which was right, this entire part of this function, at some time T is equal to 70% of the original amplitude, provided some conditions are holding T equals one half, it still holds, that's the, the same for one and two. The values of TD and SR change, so TD is now 38.5, SR is 0 0.10, and we've taken into account the 70%, so then we'll get rid of all of this. So we play the same game here, where we divided through by A0 to get some equation like this. F2 of a half is 0 0.7. What actually is F2? F2 is just the name I'm giving to taking F and plugging in these values down here to the actual TD and SR values. So it looks like we need to change this to 38.5 and this to 0 0.10. Make a copy of this because we'll need it. All right, so this is the equation that we have. We'll do the exact same thing. So F2 of t was this thing. This last equation we had said F2 of 1 half is equal to 0 0.7. So I will just go ahead and do that here. Plugged in 1 half for t. So this is equal to 0 0.7. And of course, just the, the same game. I'll apply natural log to both sides. I get some equation that looks like this. And I guess I need to multiply all of this by one half. That whole thing is equal to the natural log of 0 0.7. And the nice things happening here are that, again, the only unknowns that are appearing here are B and Okay, so this is an important equation. So we need something like this. Maybe call it, you know, label it something. It's number two, equation two, or something like that. And as in the case before, this is a step you'll want to justify explain why you can take the natural log of both sides. Um, are there any domain issues? Are there any range issues? That kind of thing. Um, say something right about how log and the exponential are an inverse pair. Um, and you should be good. Okay, so let's see. We now have this equation number two. And if we go back a little bit, it's going to zoom out here. We had this equation number one. So here is our first equation coming from using that first piece of info. Here is a second equation. Oh, some extra stuff that came along for the ride. Okay, so there are two equations and two unknowns. And that means we're in business. Uh, we can solve. Uh, 
Uh, so you'll actually get out of this process some numerical values. Well, really estimates for B and D. That was kind of the whole point of this maneuver. Remember, we're in, in the larger scheme of things, we're trying to solve for T sub D and S sub R, and we have this B and D parameter floating around, so we want to eliminate as many parameters as we can. And now we've eliminated B and D. So now the next step essentially what we want is to get C of T equals something that let's just say it only involves S sub R. Um, what I mean by this is just there's no T sub D appearing. Or, I guess, uh, B or D. But we already have numerical estimates for those, so you can just plug those directly into the formula at this point if you want. Okay, so we'll need um, to use the third and fourth piece of information from before. So, what you do here is using number four, go back to our distant past and find out what that was. We have now used number two. The last two pieces of information were about this uh, number of periods per day and this uh, sort of ideal time when diapause is triggered. Okay, so I'll just copy these here, the smaller version. So we can keep them on hand for reference. So number four said so the diapause is triggered when the oscillations decrease to 40% and that ideally this is at t equals two days. Well, we're really just playing uh, this game a third time. If I go back here, so we're doing this whole thing once more. So we just copy this in again. Okay, uh, starting from the top left, we just know that C of T is some amplitude here, uh, some F of T. So let's call F2 of T. So what do we want to plug in now? Well, this will be an unknown. I think this one was, oh wait, sorry, this is a T sub D, I think. Yep. T sub D squared. And then there's a minus D S sub R squared. We're defining a function called F3 here. Really just all of these F's are just different versions of this exponential where we're just plugging in various things. Um, here, I haven't plugged in anything yet, so what I've just written here is just F of T. And you multiply it by T at the end. And the reason it'll be an F3 of T is because you'll have an estimate for uh, B coming from that last part. That'll be an actual number, and you'll have an estimate for D. That'll be an actual number. Leave it up to you to find out what those numbers are. Uh, but now you'll have some function where the, the unknowns are T, D, and S, R. And so we can't do this part. We don't really know what T, D, and S, R actually are. But we can do this part. All right, so this says the diapause is triggered when oscillations decrease to 40%, which should occur at two days. So this is just translating this into a mathematical formula. This is telling me that a naught f of t, or f3 of t, which is this uh, third 
amplitude where we've sort of found values of B and D and we've actually plugged them in. Uh, when the oscillations decrease to 40%, so this is 0 0.4 A naught, this is supposed to occur at T equals two days. And right, this could be or 48 hours or minutes or seconds, depending on how you do things. And okay, now we can sort of continue the same game. So we need to solve something that looks like F3 of T equals 0 0.4. We just drop that on the next page. So that's what f3 of t is. We need to set this equal to 0 0.4. Now we're just going to take the log of both sides. So nothing new, nothing fancy happening here. I guess we should have plugged in t equals uh, 2. We take the log of that side, brings that down. On this side, we get the log of 0 0.4. And right, let's let's ask ourselves what were we originally trying to do? We're trying to sort of uh, solve for SR or TD in one of these in terms of the other. So at this point, we can do something like this. Um, you have TD and SR appearing here, one equation and two unknowns. So you can solve for one in terms of the other. And I'll maybe just mention one other thing you might need here. Well, so what you're going to get is that... Yeah, so let's just note that this is... Or rather, it only involves... TD, NSR, so for example, solve for, say, SR equals something. Maybe this something will be an H of TD. Okay, I'll mention just one other thing that will be useful here. Um, let me go back to the actual original equation. Right, so there's this part of the original equation, if we're just looking at the C of T. And I mentioned near the beginning that it's important to note that this thing is a frequency, omega. So let me just pull this into the last page. And there's a plus phi here. So just from looking at this term, one thing you'll want to do is use piece of info number four. It's going to give you a little bit more information about this. Just go back to find what that actually was. It was, uh, or sorry, I guess number number three here. Just number of periods per day. It's piece of info number three. Just recalling what that was. 72 periods per day and what I claim you could do here is that so you have one equation of this form omega is equal to 4 TD over 5 plus SR over 5 so that's one equation you have just from <clears throat> just from calling this thing omega and you can get another equation from this piece of data somehow. Omega equals something else. 
and this will be your input into that. So you have to sort of uh, uh, think, think about a way to convert this 72 periods per day into something that looks like um, something you can feed into a cosine function. So you might end up needing to do something like, uh, so let's see, maybe 24 hours in one day. So now you have uh, periods per hour. And let's see, or sorry, this was, uh, I think cycles is the, the terminology they use here. Sorry, one sec, let me just check. Yeah, so I think they, they use uh, cycles. So you just might call this cycles instead. You have one day for every 24 hours. And maybe you want to have something like 2 pi radians per one cycle. So maybe something roughly along these lines is what you might want to use for that. Okay. And when you do that, you should be able to, so there'll be some intermediate work, but this should be enough info to let you write C of T equals uh, well, something involving now or so maybe something not involving uh, B, D, or say T sub D. So maybe you solve for so i.e. only in terms of SR, and then maybe there's an A not. And you may or may not, from this kind of information up here, you may be able to to uh, determine that uh, phase shift that was occurring in the cosine wave in the equation. And so this is kind of the ideal situation where now you're just down to, in terms of A naught and SR, uh, you might need to do a couple of extra steps to sort out what that phase shift is. Um, but essentially what you'll get here is now something, um, well, maybe I won't say too much more about this. You need to maximize something. So whatever that something is will be a quadratic. So maybe in SR, for example. So you get something that looks like maybe something SR squared. There'll be some term in front of it, plus something SR, plus some constant term. So maybe you'll end up with some equation like that. You want to graph it. Of course, it's just some kind of parabola, I guess, in this case. Well, I guess, yeah, I guess at this point you should check with the physical intuition to see whether this should be an ups, up, like a parabola facing up or a parabola facing down. But in either case, let's just say you get one that's facing down and you're maximizing. Then you essentially just want to find the vertex of that from optimizing this equation. 
Okay, so that should at least give you enough information to get uh, pretty well started on the first uh, section and uh, sort of moving into the, the second one where you're finding the slowest rate of decay.